Look at this. Actually put my phone on silent for a video. Shock, I know. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon guys and welcome back to my channel. I hope you're having a beautiful day. Welcome to something which I've really looked into lately. So, we all know I love Sterling, live here. After wanting to come here for many years, I have loved the city of Stirling since the first day that I came here and since my grandparents had a timeshare just outside of Stirling in a lovely little location called Aberfoyle. So Stirling and I go way back but I never got to learn the history of Stirling at school because I went to an English school despite the fact that I'm Scottish. So I thought that one, I love to learn. Two, I love Sterling. So I thought while I'm off uni, I thought I'd take the incredible opportunity to learn about the Sterling Castle and the monument. I'm pointing because that's either side of me that they are. <laughs> Not that you guys know that. But as you can see up there, I actually have a Sterling like landscape picture canvas thing in my flat and to be honest it just sums up my love of sterling so without further ado let's go okay so this whole video came about because we went and walked the dog up past the castle and I still haven't been inside the castle or the monument yet, which I am slightly ashamed of, the fact that I am Scottish and I haven't been in them. But I'll go eventually. I really want to go this summer while it's still nice and sunny and I can see the views in nice kind of weather. <laughs> and we all laugh so very much. But I can see both the castle and the monument from my flat and also I have walked up to see the outsides of both the monument and the castle. So I kind of thought, do you know what, I'm going to look into the history. So first things first that I realised, Stirling Castle actually wasn't used until they built the Stirling Bridge. So the Stirling Bridge, or the old Stirling Bridge as it's known now, basically was the equivalent of the Forth Road Bridge and was used to mark the gateway between the Highlands and the Lowlands. So it was the main way of transporting goods across the River Forth. So they obviously built the Stirling Bridge and the bridge was it's still quite narrow apparently you could only fit two people down it i think they've widened it since and it's literally just situated just outside of Raplock. you can walk over it now it's pedestrianized it's not able to be driven over because they are trying to protect it because it is such an important thing but i have walked over that bridge a thousand times and i've never realized the historical importance of it and that is absolutely crazy. So basically, the castle was originally inhabited to kind of use as a lookout protective point for the bridge. So Stirling is originally known as the gateway to the Highlands because that's what it was. It was the way that they could transport goods from the Lowlands to the Highlands across the Stirling Bridge. And the first person to inhabit Stirling Castle was Alexander the First, King of Scotland. So he was the first kind of guy who was like, Do you know what? There's a perfectly good building up on the crags that has a really good view. Let's make it more of a castle. So there was originally some sort of a building there, but it wasn't what it looks like today or even remotely close. So he was like, Do you know what? Let's use this, lads. We got plenty of space we got plenty of time and it's perfect view because Stirling is very mountainy and it uses that to its advantage and historically the Scots have used it to its advantage which I will come on to later. So eventually the 12th century kind of carried on and then the 13th century, the late 13th century Alexander III died leaving no heir or direct heir so he didn't have a son 
he didn't have any children um so the scots were kind of like oh crap what do we do um ah uh, help so Edward I was brought in to mediate and basically look after things. But he was like, nah, do you know what, lads? I want Scotland. This is mine. So, this is where big William Wallace comes in. So, at the Battle of Stirling Bridge, Edward I tried to conquer Stirling and Scotland in whole. Because Stirling is the ancient capital of Scotland, is where the rulers tended to live. The castle was basically the home to the monarchy. So Edward was like, haha, I want Scotland. William Wallace was like, nah mate. So William Wallace used his tactical advantage, tactical knowledge of the area and was said to overlook the Stirling Bridge, which is just outside Raplock, and overlook it and he was tactical, he attacked early, managed to separate the English onto either side of the bridge. So some of them were drowning because they were pushed off the bridge, some of them basically just turned back and fled, and then the others were all led into boggy land. So because of the heavy armour, it meant that they couldn't move as well. So basically they were just bait. I mean, you're screwed. <laughs> So at the end, just before the 1300s, William Wallace kind of was like, nah, Edward, screw you, pal. This is mine. You will never take our freedom. But they'll never take our freedom! Each to their own. He cannot control that horse in that film. Not gonna lie, Big Ed was pretty raging about this. Wasn't overly happy at the fact that he had not been able to conquer Scotland. Held a grudge basically tried to seek revenge against Big Wallace for the rest of his life. And eventually William Wallace was captured and taken down to London where he was eventually hung, drawn and quartered just because Edward could. Life isn't fair, let's teach them that from the off. <laughs> eventually Edward I kind of popped his clogs. Edward II comes in because they kind of like to rename their children after themselves, which would have been really weird when you think about it in that situation because the mum would have been like Edward come and get your dinner and then both of them would have come running but anyway so <laughs> Edward II eventually was inhabiting the castle but he lost control of it to Robert the Bruce so Robert the Bruce kind of regained Scotland for Scotland and therefore that is why he is the local hero hero of the country in general. So Robert the Bruce faced Edward II at the Battle of Bannockburn. Basically, Edward II didn't have a clue what he was getting himself in for, didn't realise that it was boggy land, and the exact same thing that happened at Stirling Bridge basically happened again, where Robert the Bruce basically just killed them all. Listen to my genuine laughter. <laughs> and Edward II fled like a little coward. Ed fled. <laughs> Robert the Bruce was a pretty intelligent guy, kind of came to the conclusion that people kept attacking him and Scotland because they wanted the castle and they wanted to have the power over the Stirling Bridge and the kind of passing between the Highlands and the Lowlands. So he kind of was like, do you know what? I'm not letting my enemies do this anymore and basically burnt the castle because then they had nothing to fight for which in some ways is a really intelligent thing, but historically it's not really good for us because then the next people just had to go and build it all again. But anyway, that's a spoiler. The castle eventually was reborn and it was governed by the Stuart family. Now the Stuart family basically rebuilt the whole castle and eventually turned it into what we see today. Some of the oldest parts of the castle actually still stand back to some of the James's eras, the James Stuart's eras. So the James the Fourth kind of era where they definitely revived the castle and judged it all up and made it into what it is now. So James one, two and three were basically absolute weirdos, wanted to get absolutely hammered all the time, kind of died young, didn't really have any interests, were kind of brutal. James the Fourth, however, was quite interested in art, music. It's told that he could eat eat he could eat he could speak about eight languages and he was a much more intellectual man so 
he basically made a great hall, a bit like in Hogwarts, and yeah, he filled it with art, music, he threw parties. He was a little bit more of a cool kind of guy rather than I'm going to slit you through. This is the era where whiskey starts to de develop its name. This is kind of the era where whiskey kind of... It was already kind of made, but it wasn't quite whiskey. But basically, um, James IV um, had an alchemist in the castle and he hired an alchemist and he kind of used whiskey and that's where whiskey became the medicine of people in Scotland and it's still used too much today. <laughs> so yeah, but James IV ended up marrying Margaret Tudor who was the daughter of Henry VII and Henry VIII's sister. So this is obviously very important. This is going to bridge Scotland and England eventually into one nation um but obviously that's a lot further down the line big margaret gave birth to six children i mean the thought of that actually pains me but that meant that there were a lot of children to be heir to the scottish throne so james the fourth eventually died at the battle of Flodden, Flodden field where he was defending scotland against the english again scotland england the fight is on as per usual it's still going on because nobody can settle an argument do we have a referendum do we have a second one do we do what oh nobody knows because let's be real it's been an age-old decision should we be the uk or should we be scotland and england because who the heck knows but anyway let's not get into politics <sighs> so after the death of his father guess who came along james v and he gave birth to Mary, Queen of Scots, who obviously starts to tie up the link between the Tudors and the Stuarts. So, Mary, Queen of Scots, was a pretty cool chick. She inherited the Scottish throne and was crowned at the age of nine months old. What? Nine months old? How can you have someone in charge of your country at not even a year old? Kids these days... If they were in charge of the throne at, say, say a kid was a king at five years old, we would be having Playstations every day. Like, that would be a law. It baffles me how a kid could be a ruler at nine months old. But anyway, Mary's mother uh, was a French woman and Henry VIII wanted Mary Queen of Scots to marry into the Tudor family to create the bond between England and Scotland but Mary's mother didn't want that because she was French and she wanted the alliance between Scotland and France to continue so she actually betrothed her to a French man and eventually they did marry but in the meantime Mary basically got locked up in Stirling Castle and was told you shall not pass because she didn't want her mother didn't want any of the English people to get her hands on her what bro what are you talking about man so Mary eventually married the King of France became King of Ki Queen of France and Queen of Scots again bridged the alliance between France and Scotland Scotland, which had lived for thousands of years. So this is where the battle between Mary, Queen of Scots and Queen, Queen Elizabeth I come in. Basically, Queen Elizabeth was like, you, no, no, hen, you, you aren't taking my throne. And yeah, it's a longer story than that, but that's not what I know. And it's too long to go into because this video is already going to be too long. So Mary, Queen of Scots remarried after the death of her husband. Um, and married her cousin, which, you know, is totally a historical Middle Ages Tudor time thing to do, and had a son who they called James because it's Scotland and everybody's called James. And this guy was James the Sixth. So when he inherited the throne, he was James the Sixth. When Henry, the, when Elizabeth the First died, they didn't have a clue who was to take the throne. And eventually, James VI became the first James to rule England because he was the heir to the English throne, the next in line. But, 
obviously he was heir to the he was on the Scottish and the English throne and for the first time ever we had someone on the throne in both countries and everything was happy until you get to 2015 or so where people want to have a referendum but that's another story and absolutely nothing to do with it. So when James VI took over throne for England, bam, wham, thank you ma'am, we have Great Britain. So he was the first king to rule over Scotland, England and Ireland and woohoo, we have Great Britain. So that is the story of Stirling Castle, but how does the monument come into it? So Walter Scott, Sir Walter Scott, the famous poet person, basically he's an absolute legend in Scotland, he recovered the crown jewels after they were kind of locked up in Edinburgh because they kind of just had a crown jewels for Great Britain. They didn't need separate ones anymore because James the first's children would, or James the sixth of Scotland, his children would eventually be the next king or queen to Great Britain and boom you've got, that's how you get to Liz the second now. But, the, so they locked up the Scottish crown jewels to prevent all of this kick off happening again. They didn't need anybody to take the Scottish throne because we have a united kingdom. Walter Scott eventually got the crown jewels back because he perceived them to be a national treasure, which is exactly what they are. Um, and the people kind of raised money to tribute William Wallace because William Wallace was the first leader to protect Scotland and to be known for protecting Scotland against the English and to be known for his tactics. Sure, Robert the Bruce was an absolute legend, but big William Wallace was the first guy to do that. So they wanted to tribute him. So people raised funds, eventually they started building, but eventually they kind of didn't have enough money because let's be real we've all seen location 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 or where they tried to build houses and they always go over budget because nobody ever expects there to be a leaky house or there to be something wrong with it but they kind of built the monument to commemorate William Wallace and it's built on the same crag that William Wallace supposedly looked over um, Edward's army at the Battle of Stirling Bridge so that's why it's built in the place that it's built. I'm not overly too sure on the historical accuracy of that. Nobody is, let's be real, we weren't around at that time. And the top of the monument is to signify the crown of Scotland, basically that Scotland was protected by Wallace and if you look at the top of it it does look like a crown and this is where Walter Scott link links in so that's all of my history of Stirling Castle in a nutshell what I've learned I know it's a lot of information but I thought that people coming to Stirling might be interested to know it I'm in no way a historian but this is what I've learned um over the past week or so that I've been looking up these things. So thank you so much for watching. I am going to go into the castle at some point and I will vlog it. If you want more videos like this about Sterling, give this a thumbs up, give me ideas down below in the comments. I love Sterling, I think it's the best city in Scotland, I think it's the best city in England, UK, whatever. And to be honest, it is the place that I feel is the most it's, it's the most city without being city that makes no sense but anyway um, please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it click the subscribe button to see more videos from me I'm obviously always around about Stirling Scotland Britain in the water out the water all sorts of things ring the notification bell to get notified whenever I post a video and I'll see you guys in the next one love you guys so much bye